Today we're going to talk about the most important wars in New Zealand history. These are the conflicts which broke Māori sovereignty of New Zealand. They're the reason Aotearoa is governed according to British legal traditions and not tikanga Māori. It's the reason most land is owned by Pākehā instead of Māori. It's the reason my hometown in Hamilton is named after a British officer who never even visited the place. Ever walk down a Grey Street or a Von Tempsky Street or Cameron Street? The legacy of the New Zealand wars surrounds us every day. I'm William Ray. And I'm Lee Madame McLaughlin. This is the Aotearoa History Show. Last episode, we talked about the opening act of the New Zealand wars, the Northern War. All through that war, the British settlers had been nervous. When they looked south from Auckland, they could see the enormous, powerful tribes of Waikato. If Waikato Māori decided to unite with Honeheke and Kawati, they could march north and wipe out the city of Auckland. Aucklanders were seriously worried about this, but that attack never happened. That's because Waikato Māori didn't think the Northern War had anything to do with them. And that makes sense if you remember Māori were, and in many ways still are, a tribal people. If Ngāpuhi got taken down a peg by the British, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing for Māori and the rest of the North Island. Māori thought of their identity more in terms of their links with hapu or iwi than race. Māori nationalism was in its infancy. Also, Pākehā and Auckland were valuable trading partners for Waikato Māori. The great Tainui chief, Pōtato Te Werowero, referred to Auckland as the hem of his cloak, meaning that it was protected by his mana. But that didn't mean Waikato Māori weren't worried about Pākehā. By this point, the Pākehā population was skyrocketing. When the Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840, there were about 2,000 Europeans in New Zealand. Ten years later, there were more than 20,000. Pretty much all of those Pākehā desperately wanted land. That's the whole reason they came here in the first place. In 1846, land disputes kicked off fighting between colonists and Māori in the Hutt Valley. Mostly this was Ngāti Rangatahi and Ngāti Tama with support from Ngāti Toa. It started a bit like the Waido incident a few years earlier. The New Zealand company made a dodgy land deal which led to a big scrap over where to draw the border between Māori and Pākehā land. Governor George Grey sent in troops to drive the local Māori off their land and handed it over to the colonists. And Grey wasn't just taking land at gunpoint. He also directed government agents to make a much more aggressive approach to land sales. He convinced Naitahu to sell basically the entire South Island to the Crown for less than a penny an acre, with promises the Crown would set up a special reserve for the iwi. Those promises to set aside land were never honoured, despite protests from Ngaitahu. But on the whole, Grey had a pretty good relationship with Māori. He often travelled with powerful chiefs and consulted them on tricky policy questions. He organised loans for Māori to buy farm equipment. He even built hospitals for Māori to use. In 1852, he wrote a letter back to England saying, Both races already form one harmonious community, insensibly forming one people. Then, job done, Grey sailed off to South Africa to run Cape Colony, but that wasn't the last we saw of him. In the meantime, cracks start to form in that harmonious community. By the late 1850s, there were nearly 60,000 Pākehā in New Zealand. For the first time in our history, Māori were outnumbered, and the pressure for land was getting more intense. Many Māori realised Te Tiriti or Waitangi was not going to be enough to protect their land. But at the same time, they didn't want war. So they start coming up with other tactics. Lots of Māori thought the problem was that they weren't negotiating with the British on equal terms. The British were unified under the leadership of Queen Victoria. Māori leadership was divided by iwi or hapū. Some rangatira like Tamihana Te Paraha and Piri Kawo had travelled to the UK and met the Queen. When they got home, they kicked off the idea of creating a similar kind of unifying leader for Māori, 
a Maori king with the authority to deal with the British on behalf of all tangata wenua, or at least on behalf of a big group of Maori who signed up to the idea. These Maori called themselves the Kingitanga movement. And we need to point out, this isn't like Rob Stark declaring himself the King of the North in Game of Thrones. Kingitanga weren't trying to rebel against the British Crown. One of Kingitanga's founders, Ngāti Hoa Rangatira Wiramu Tamihana, had a good way of explaining things. Tamihana said Kingitanga, the Governor and the Crown were like three sticks. The Kingitanga stick represented the Māori King's authority over Māori land and people. The governor's stick represented his authority over Pākehā in New Zealand. The third stick was balanced on top, and it represented Queen Victoria and the law of God. According to the real Māori version of Te Tiriti, this should have all been fine. That version said Māori had the right to rangatiratanga, to self-government. If they wanted a king, all good. The first Māori king was Pōtato Te Whirofiro, paramount rangatira of Waikato. To say Te Whero Whero had a lot of mana would be an understatement. He was a respected leader with whakapapa links to pretty much every major iwi in the North Island. He was also on pretty good terms with Pākehā because of his vow to defend Auckland. But he was also a pretty old man. Te Whero Whero only led Kingitanga for two years before he died, and the crown passed to his son Tāwhiao and Tafiao immediately had to deal with yet another fight over a dodgy land deal. This time it was in New Plymouth, and it quickly escalated into open war between the British Army and Taranaki Māori. The new governor, Gore Brown, sent in hundreds of troops, but just like in the Northern War, those troops had a hard time assaulting heavily fortified pa. Hundreds of people died, and millions of dollars worth of property was destroyed. Governor Brown lost his job. And the authorities brought back Governor Gray, since he seemed to have been so good at dealing with Māori in the past. But things had changed. Waikato Māori were much more suspicious of Gray thanks to his pushy attitude towards land sales. And Gray was extremely suspicious of Waikato Māori too. To him, Kingitanga were rebels, directly challenging his authority over New Zealand. I mean, according to the English version of the Treaty of Waitangi, Māori had ceded all the rights and powers of sovereignty to the crown. How can you give up sovereignty and then go and set up your own sovereign? It's the same fundamental problem with the treaty we talked about last episode. The two different versions say two totally different things about sovereignty. But the real problem for Governor Gray was Kingitanga's opposition to land sales. Gray was under very heavy pressure from the settlers to get more Māori to sell their land. But Kingitanga refused. They could clearly see that losing land also meant losing wealth and power. Still, Gray was a sly dude, and he had a few ideas of how to deal with Kingitanga. First, Gray tried to undermine them by setting up a network of Māori councils or runanga to lessen Kingitanga's authority over Māori. But this plan failed, partly because Kingitanga's allies held firm and partly because Governor Gray tried to cram former enemy tribes like Te Arua, Ngāti Awa and Ngāi Te Rangi into a single runanga. Not going to happen. So, Governor Gray came up with another plot. All through the early 1860s, he sent letters to the imperial authorities in London saying the Kingitanga tribes were secretly planning to attack the city of Auckland. Well, liar, liar, pants on fire. Yeah, that was complete nonsense. Kingitanga had no plans to attack Auckland. Again, they might have been against land sales, but they still saw themselves as loyal subjects of Queen Victoria. But the colonial authorities took Gray's letters very seriously and sent enormous numbers of troops to New Zealand from all across the British Empire. Gray wrote an ultimatum to the Waikato chiefs, saying that unless they pledged their loyalty to Queen Victoria, he would invade and confiscate their land. But before the message even reached those chiefs, Governor Gray launched his invasion. The Waikato War was by far the largest conflict of the New Zealand wars. Gray eventually had 10,000 imperial troops, plus another 4,000 colonial soldiers and a few hundred kūpapa Māori, Māori allied with the government. That army would have been as big as a quarter of the entire Māori population. And taking them on was the Kingitanga, which had about 5,000 warriors at most. But Kingitanga were well prepared for an attack. Many of them were veterans of the musket wars, and they adopted a lot of the same notorious anti-artillery tactics. 
they had three lines of defence. The most extensive was the Patarangi Line, a network of forts, bunkers and trenches which stretched from Tiawamutu to the Waipa River. Storming Patarangi would have cost a lot of lives, so instead the British General Duncan Cameron sent 1,200 troops to sneak through the bush at night and attack the village of Rangiaufia the next morning. What happened next is the subject of much debate, but amidst the fighting, five or six soldiers and at least 12 Māori were killed, maybe many more Māori, and their dead included women, old people and children. Some were trapped and burned to death in a wadi. This was a really nasty chapter of the war for Waikato Māori and it's also very controversial. Kingitanga thought Rangi Alfia was a safe haven. Nine days earlier they'd told the Anglican Bishop of New Zealand, George Selwyn, that they were keeping their non-combatants in the town. They believed Bishop Selwyn had passed this message on to the British General Duncan Cameron and that General Cameron had agreed not to attack Rangiaufia. Waikato leaders like Wiramute Kumite were horrified that Grace seemed to have gone back on his word. General Cameron told us to send our women and children to Rangiaufia, where they should remain unmolested. But he went away from Paterangi with his soldiers after them, and the women and children were killed, and some of them burnt in the houses. You did not go to fight the men. You left them and went away to fight with the women and children. But it's unclear if General Cameron really did promise not to attack Rangiaufia. The town was a major part of Kingitanga's military supply line, and historians like James Balich think it's very unlikely Cameron would have agreed to leave it untouched. Balich says it's possible there was some misunderstanding or misinterpretation in the conversation between Māori, Bishop Selwyn and General Cameron. On the other hand, another historian, Vincent O'Malley, points out it's also possible that British leaders misled Kingitanga on purpose so that Rangi Alpia would be more vulnerable to attack. Either way, the attack on Rangi Alpia had two major consequences for the wider war. First, it forced Waikato warriors to abandon Paterangi and retreat. Second, it seriously damaged the faith of Kingitanga Māori and European missionaries. Many believed Bishop Selwyn had deliberately conspired to betray them. This helped fuel the rise of new religious movements, which played a significant role later on in the New Zealand Wars. We'll talk more about that next episode. About a month after Rangi Alpia, 300 Māori made a stand at Orako Pa near Te Awamitu. But Orako was not as well supplied as Paterangi and it was easily surrounded. The defenders held out for three days when the British put them under siege, but they eventually ran out of food, water and ammunition. The defenders were offered a final chance to surrender. Instead, Riwi Mania Poto sent this famous message to the British Army. E hoa, ka whapai tonu mātou, ake, ake, ake. Friend, we will fight on forever, forever and forever. The British then offered to give the women and children a chance to flee, but they refused. One high-ranking wahine, Ahumai Te Pairata, stepped up to the parapet and shouted this to the British troops. Ki te mate ngā tāne, me mate anō ngā wahine me ngā tamariki. If the men die, the women and children must die also. The defenders at Orako beat back several attacks, but the situation was hopeless. They made a run for it, and as they ran, they were cut down by the British. About half the defenders were killed. According to witnesses on both sides, those casualties included wounded women who were bayoneted in cold blood by colonial soldiers. The stories from Orako are horrific, but also heroic. For example, Ahumai Te Pairata made it out alive. Here's how the story was told by the early New Zealand historian James Cowan. She was shot in the right side, the bullet going through her body and coming out her left side. She was shot through the right shoulder, the bullet went out at her back. She was also hit in the wrist, hand and arm. Yet wounded almost unto death as she was, she struggled through the swamp of death that lay between the Orako Ridge and the Puniu River, the line of retreat on which scores of her comrades were killed. She survived. This was the end of the Waikato War. The survivors of Orako crossed into the lands of Ngāti Mania Poto, 
Today we call that land the King Country because it became the last bastion of Kingitanga. At this point, Governor Gray and General Cameron decided to end their pursuit of the main Kingitanga army. The land they'd taken in the Waikato region was the really good farmland. The land in the King Country was less valuable. Instead, they struck at Kingitanga's allies in Tauranga and the Bay of Plenty. But Tauranga Māori weren't easy pickings. At the Battle of Gate Pa, Ngai Terangi and their allies used the same anti-artillery defence tactics that we've mentioned earlier, and it was brutally effective. A hundred British troops were killed or wounded as they tried to storm Gate Pa under a hail of musket fire. The British turned and ran. 230 Māori had defeated nearly 1,700 Imperial troops. After the battle ended, the Māori defenders brought water to injured soldiers. Some even took them home to treat their wounds. The British were touched by the gesture, but it didn't stop them from continuing the war. A few months later, they launched a surprise attack at Teranga, inflicting heavy losses on Māori who were busy trying to build a new pa. Tauranga Māori eventually negotiated a peace deal with the British, but Gate Pa left a huge impression on both sides of the conflict. Yeah, like remember this guy? He was one of the senior officers killed at Gate Pa, and they named a whole town after him. General Cameron was fed up. He didn't think this war was what the British had signed up for. He thought his job was defending the settlers in Auckland from Kingitanga, not conquering Māori land way over in the Bay of Plenty. The authorities back in London were furious. To understand why, you have to zoom out a bit from New Zealand. The British had to deal with a lot of wars around this time. They were fighting in India, Africa, China, the Middle East, Japan. Plus, they were dealing with the aftermath of the Crimean War, which cost the lives of more than 20,000 soldiers. And in the middle of all this, Grey basically tricked them into sending thousands of troops to New Zealand and then got a lot of them killed, even though they massively outnumbered and outgunned their opponents. Eventually, the authorities in London sent this letter to Governor Grey. 10,000 English troops have been placed at your disposal for objects of great imperial concern and not for the attainment of any merely local object. You will not continue the expenditure of blood and treasure longer than is absolutely necessary for the establishment of a just and enduring peace. A just and enduring peace is not what happens. But we do see a bit of a lull in the fighting as British troops start to be shipped out of New Zealand. From now on, if the Pākehā authorities wanted to pick a fight, they would have to rely on colonists and their Māori allies. This really changed the character of the New Zealand wars. It made them more personal. Plus, we see religion play a bigger role in the conflict. And all of that combined to make the final chapter of the New Zealand wars a very, very dark story. That's all coming up in the next episode. Thanks for joining us on the Aotearoa History Show, produced by RNZ and made possible by the RNZ New Zealand On Air Digital Innovation Fund. Kia ora team, thank you so much for listening to this latest episode of the Aotearoa History Show. Uh, don't forget to subscribe below, give us a like. Yeah, and click that little notification button, the little bell down the bottom. That'll let you know about all of our episodes coming up. And please tell your friends about this, because if you think they need to know this, this is where to get it.